good morning. This could be very interesting because at 825 I discovered that the music video that I was building my sermon around didn't make it to the computer. So you may see something that's a little bit raw. It was going to be a short sermon anyway. Because I thought Sam was praying today and I would have plenty of time. <laughs> Our virtue for the month of February is love. And the orange curriculum that we follow defines love as choosing to treat others as you would want to be treated. Well, if that seems a little familiar, consider Luke 6, 31. Do to others as you would, you would have them do to you. So by this definition, the virtue of love is just the golden rule with choosing put in front of it. And that doesn't feel much like a definition of love to me. The maximum of reciprocity, the philosophical name for the golden rule, has been around in its negative form since the earliest writings. <clears throat> that which you hate to have done to you, do not do to another. The first written record of the rule in positive form is in Leviticus 9.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Christ combined this Deuteronomy 6.5, to give his answer to the Pharisees in Matthew 22.37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So there's no way that this new orange definition has helped me to understand love. It's an example, maybe a function of love, but it's certainly not a definition. And you know, if I'm up here, there's going to be a science part of the lesson. I'm sorry, here it is. Advances in neuroscience since the invention of the functional MRI have shown centuries of teaching about the brain to be wrong. Essentially, everything I was ever taught about emotions has been debunked in the last 15 years. Feelings are not universal. Feelings are not inherited. Feelings are not the same in different species. There is not a specific part of the brain associated with a particular emotion. For example, anger is not from the amygdala. The universal facial expressions attributed to people and animals, especially dogs, do not correlate with MRI imaging findings. The interrogation techniques taught in the military and law enforcement cannot be validated by this technology. What is known now is that feelings are created in the brain using most, if not all, of the brain in an unconscious or pre-conscious level. They are part of a brain system called interoception, none of you needs to remember that, turned on at birth and turned off at death and they all occur outside of conscious awareness. The brain has measurable activity continuously. The activity level varies with sleep and wakefulness, but the brain is always on and much more active than we ever thought. Only a very small percentage of all brain activity ever becomes conscious thought or awareness. The best guess is that we're only aware of about 3% of what our brain is doing. Now the science gets really, really weird. The only way we can become aware of any feeling is to name it. Strange as it seems, in order for a feeling to come to the conscious level, there must be a word for the feeling. In cultures where there is no word for fear, people cannot be afraid. In Greek, there are five words translated as love only two of which are used in the New Testament. So in English, we 
have the absurdity of using one word, the same word, to say, I love your hair. And surprisingly, I get that comment frequently. <laughs> we use the same word to say, God so loved you, he sent his only son to die for you. The most trivial and the most profound thoughts have to be conveyed in a single word. Now, the science part, the reason we're talking about that is because now we can understand how God can work in our brain without us knowing how he's working. It's happening at that level I was talking about in that interoceptive pathway. So what does God's love mean to you? It's something different for each one of us because our unique life experiences are processed by our unique brains. As we gain understanding, God's love becomes richer and fuller. And today we're going to consider time as love. And this is where you were supposed to see Josh Turner's song, Time and Love. It was Billboard's number one country song of 2012, a platinum record. Our culture is capable of understanding universal truth. It is capable of understanding the concept that time is love. For second service, at least, I'm going to be able to print the lyrics, so I'll be able to talk more better. But this is where I take a big, deep breath and wonder what I'm going to talk about next. <laughs> but today's scripture, both Martha and Mary are really busy. Martha opens her home to the Lord, providing the hospitality expected of first century Christians. That takes work and time to prepare and serve, while still being attentive to her guest. Martha appears to the Lord to be worried and upset. She especially wants Mary to help her, to be like her, to do the same work she's doing. She goes to the Lord, seeking his affirmation, and is gently rebuked. Martha's distraction has caused her to be rude to her guest, not just by being distracted by Mary's behavior, but by sharing her worry with her guest. Mary is spending time with the Lord, sitting at his feet, listening. She has assumed the role of student, sitting at the feet of the rabbi. Unusual, only because this is first century Israel, and women didn't sit at the feet of rabbis and learn. This is the passage that has really been used to express Jesus bringing women into the church. They just didn't get there before. The tasks of both women are important in the service of the Lord. We must be busy in his service, but not so busy if we have no time to listen to him or for him. Time spent in service is important, for faith without works is dead. But Martha's distraction precludes gracious attention to her guest. Her worry and her distraction keep her from being present with Jesus as she serves him. Mary is spending the time to develop a personal relationship with Christ. Mary has chosen what Christ says is better and will not be taken from her. From this, we learn that hospitality, and by inference, service is important, but must be rooted in relationship with Christ. Both of them are time expressions of love. So where does all this love come from? I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Jeremiah 31 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 136 1. Followed by 25 more stanzas that end, his love endures forever. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4 19. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. And God in them, 1 John 4, 16. In fact, all of 1 John pretty much talks about love. 
scripture kind of sort of tells me that love comes from God, that there is no other source. And how do we get that love? Well, you have to make two choices. First, you have to choose Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then you have to allow the Holy Spirit into your heart. God does the rest. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Romans 5, 5. This love is a gift. It's not something you learn. You chose it, but you didn't earn it. It is supernatural. It gets incorporated into our unconscious brain and becomes part of our interoceptive system. What we learn in his presence is the love that we can share. And in the second service, the hymn is going to be the gift of love. And in verse 3 that says, it well, come spirit, come, our hearts control, our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every deed, by this we worship and are free. What God has freely given us, we return to him and share with our neighbor. In the video clip is supposed to show vignettes of God's love flowing through us in time spent in a relationship, but that didn't happen, so. <clears throat> time in the presence of the Lord, whether in scripture, prayer, meditation, or worship, enables our transformation as children of God to allow his love to flow through us. We can choose to spend time to learn that love. We can choose to spend time with others to pass that love along. We can choose to treat others the way we wish to be treated. So I ask you what God's love means to you. I suppose it's only fair that I should answer what God's love means to me. For it's not the same as yesterday, nor is it likely to be the same tomorrow. It continues to be molded by my subconscious and my conscious brain into working practices. Our spiritual journeys are usually strolls through life rather than sprints. And they have clear inflection points where we recognize change, a change that is the growth that lets us better receive God's love and transmit that love. From the age of my confirmation, I have known about God. I've known about His grace and about His love. Over the years, I've experienced His presence, His miracles, and His blessings. Despite that, I've never really accepted His grace or experience. And since I have a minute and a half to fill, I guess maybe I should talk about some of that. God's presence. I clearly remember the first time I felt God's presence and where I was. I was sitting at about 13,000 feet on the ridge line between Capitol Peak and Snowmass Peak in the second range of mountains in Colorado on an absolutely beautiful day as I was trying to complete my trek of climbing all 52, 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado before I graduated from high school. And that didn't happen. But that day, for the first time, I felt what I described since as God's presence, that, that overwhelming feeling of knowing that He is there. And I'm not sure why it takes a setting like sitting on a ridge line, looking out at three other ridge lines with the clouds below the tops of the peaks and you're above the clouds to get that feeling. And as I've grown older, I've been grown better in uh, spiritual practices, I don't have to do that to get back into God's presence. But that's the first time I remember even. Some people feel it. I've heard many people describe feeling God's presence when they look into the face of the newborn child. All of us 
us can have a life experience that we can relate to know when we've been in that presence. The blessings, oh my gracious. My gratitude has been so long. <clears throat> Five years ago, when I first developed a gratitude list, I really didn't have anything that I recognized that I could be thankful for. The last time I went to visit my grandchildren, I started praying gratitude in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and I was still praying when I got to the Texas line. Blessings just keep accruing. Miracles. In 40 years of medical practice in this community, I can't even begin to list God's miracles. But despite that, I have never really accepted his grace. Until about six years ago. I finally did get to that point in my jury that I could accept that gift of grace. And I adop adopted a personal mission statement allowing the Holy Spirit to work through me to express God's will. Some months later, I woke on a Monday morning experiencing God's love. He is an awesome God. And I love Him so. That feeling has been there since. The sermon the Sunday before had been on, God, on a Father's love. And I was finally willing to acknowledge that I was capable of being loved. God's love is ineffable. That's one of my absolutely favorite words. Go look up ineffable. What it means is, I don't have any idea what that means. <laughs> but it describes things you absolutely know what are, but can't describe. Like the smell of a rose. Go ahead, try to describe what a rose smells like. Or to describe to someone what chocolate tastes like. I mean, and you come back to, it tastes like chocolate. There's no other word. That's God's love. The feeling includes bunches of stuff. It includes an overwhelming sense of peace and serenity. It includes profound joy. It includes forgiveness and acceptance. And it includes humility, finally realizing who I am in God's world. But it isn't any one of them. And at the same time, it's all of them. It's like taking the essence of everything pure and distilling it into a single Supernatural. It's a gift of the Spirit, and it is mine to share. Time in the presence of the Lord, whether in scripture, prayer, meditation, or worship, enables our transformation as children of God to allow His love to flow through us to those who choose. Heavenly Father, you are awesome, and we love you so. We thank you for your existence, for your presence, and for your choice to be interventional in our lives. We thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, and through her, the gift of love. We thank you for yet another day to enjoy the glorious creation. We pray today that we may be mindful of your presence may allow your Holy Spirit to flow through us to express your love and your will. Through us, may your love fill the world. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.